We're here today with uh, Hind Kabwat, who is a uh, Damascene and Syrian peace activist. Um, this is part of the Bradford Abelson series in religious reconciliation. Uh, Hind is our third annual speaker, who will be discussing today the prospects for peace in Syria. Um, Hind, one of the reasons I uh, was very interested in your work and, uh, and in bringing you to uh, USAO was the, the work you've done in peace activism and religious reconciliation, or reconciliation in general, um, for the past four or five years in Syria. Uh, can you tell me what, uh, say, after the Arab Spring in 2011, um, what, what kind of work you've been doing in, in Syria and, and where you see that work going? Yeah. Uh, first, we're talking about Arab Spring. Uh, it happened in 2011 in Syria, but this is a result of the bad governance in the world, in the Arab world, and the dictatorship, and the social injustice. So what happened, it is a, a natural result of things could, should happen long time ago. I was teaching uh, conflict resolution before this Arab Spring in Syria, and uh, I can see that Syrian people, they need a change. They need to live in, in dignity. And this is how this has started. Uh, after the revolution and uh, six months of civil resistance, civil revolution, people, they didn't want to use any arms. They just want dignity. They just want freedom. They want the government to change and to make it easier for them. But the reaction, harsh reaction of the government in killing and uh, doing all these crimes against those civilians, this was a natural reaction for many people. They start getting arms, and this is when the start of sh shift from non-violence revolution to a arms revolution. And um, this is things after others, and the problems of the injustice and the word silence, and it's what's happening to the Syrian people. And after those 100,000 people died, this is when they start the extremes and the sectarianism and the, and the um, um, uh, death. And, and this is when I tried to take a position of, let's go to that grassroots and work with the people and see what we can do and what we can change and how do we get people in together again. And this is when I start going to the refugee camps and uh, going to the IDP camps and uh, doing uh, courses in conflict resolution and uh, critical thinking and civil building and the traumas. And this is when I decided I don't want to be silent. As a good Syrian citizen, a good Christian and, uh, and good human being, I can't leave my people alone. I want to stand by them. And since my identity is Syrian and I want to take care of the Syrian and since I've been taught from my religion, Christianity, that to take care of the small people and I thought this is where I should be in the refugee camp where the poor and the small people needed me the most. It, um, to, to go back a little bit to, to those months after the, the Arab Spring, were you initially, or uh, what, what has your relationship been with the resistance movement? Not necessarily those that have arisen in the past couple of years, but in, in those initial moments, or six months, or even mm -hmm. when it became an armed revolution, mm -hmm. um, how, uh, what has been your process in yeah. dealing with that? And in the first when this has happened, I wanted very much to be the bridge between the government and the revolutionary, and I want to, uh, to convince the government not to use forces and not to use armed forces or security uh, against uh, or intelligence and security and prison those civilians. I tried for the few months of the revolution to be the honest broker among them, but unfortunately the Syrian regime refused any advice, it refused, refused any, any things to do with let's talk with those and they have legitimate request, they want freedom, they want social justice. Let's listen what they want. And the Syrian regime refused completely to listen to any advices and they just decided they want to go uh, all the way 
to stop this revolution and to stop this uh, this uh, uh, rising for these people to just ask of like what any American or any people in the world they want freedom and justice. So the regime d uh, refused, and in May 2011, the regime killed this little boy called Hamza Al Khatib, and this is where I see my switch here. When I saw Hamza Al Khatib, a little child, he's 12 years old, being tortured and killed, I I can't I can't anymore take the uh, uh, I I needed to be with the people, and this is when I decided I, I can't do anything. When a regime kill his own people, kill its children, this is where you cannot do anything about it. So I tried, and this is where my, my I, am, I have so many friends from both sides, and I know that people think, oh, there is people from the regime side, they don't want this regime, what they're doing and killing. They're against killing. So there is people from both sides Dr. Simpson, they are against the killing. And this is where our role is to bring these people together and say, you know what, we need to stop the killing. And we know that there is people, they want this conflict in Syria to continue because they're, they have some interest, interest financially or power or anything else. So my position is I want to stand with those people who called for the freedom in the beginning. And I was, I am, I was and I still against any arms. I am with the civil resistance. I can understand. I put myself into other people's shoes why they use their arm to defend their self. But you know what? In the end of the day, you can't kill based on religion or sectarianism. Even if the regime is sectarian, even if the regime is oppressed, we can't be like the regime. You can't. You can't kill or continue the civil war in Syria. We need to have somewhere to stop and say, we need a political solution. We need this killing to stop. We need some power to tell the regime to stop uh, throwing the barrel bombs on the Syrian people, on the Syrian civilian. We need to tell the people that not every Alawite or everyone from the regime is a killer. There is so many people, they don't want this uh, war to continue. So my position is I'm taking the side of the Syrian people from both sides who are against killing and who are with the national future together, national dialogue, and to look to the future in a very positive way. We need to live together again, and we need to stop the killing. So um, speaking of the future, you visited a number of refugee camps, and oftentimes you, oftentimes you meet children there. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the, the stories from those refugee camps um, about children that give you hope for the future of Syria? Exactly. They, uh, absolutely, uh, Dr. Simpson. The children are the hope. And we have a big problem of the education. And when I see women, they're opening their own tent and they're having their life to just teach the children, this is, I consider, hope. In many of the refugee camps, in the IDP camps, so many women, they took a, a, a stand or some great youth took the stand and say, we want to teach our children. We don't want to have a lost generation. So those children, we need to teach them because you here as an institution, you know how much power the education can have in people's lives. And this is exactly what we have to think about. And I, um, I have so much respect for so many women and men in Syria. They decided we can't go into this war. We cannot be part of it. But you know what? Let's do something. And education is the question. I see lots of little kids. They're happy to have pencils. They're happy to draw. When you tell them to, to draw something, they used to draw war. And, uh, and now in so many uh, projects, and uh, there is so many projects like Sumbula and uh, Amalu Salam and other alphabet schools in Bika. There is so much project targeting the, the kids because they want them to know that the war is not the only solution. We're going to take care of your future. And this is when the kids, they decide to, I want to draw a, a sunshine and flowers. And uh, they want to, with this little girl, she was drawing a butterfly. 
And when I told her, she told me, I want to be like this butterfly so I can go back home and see what's happening to my home. And so many stories, kids, they miss home. Those kids, they don't want to be in the refugee camp, Zach. They want to go home. They want to go home to their own school and all bed and play like other kids. And I see those kids. I don't know if you heard, but in winter, this past few weeks, there is kids, they died in the refugee camps, cold. And this is not good in the 21st century to have kids dying from cold. When we're talking about children, right, and talking about this big idea in the West, you have to know that there's kids are dying because they're cold in the refugee camps and the IDP camps. And we have to know that, yes, big power, we're not asking the big power for boots on the ground. We're not asking them to go and, and kill. All we ask them, we need some security and safety for those children. We need to stop the barrel bombs. We need to stop the killing. Those kids, they need education. And if we don't have for them a proper school, proper education, we're going to have a lost generation. And this is when the ISIS will come and recruit our kids because those kids, they need hope. And if we don't have for them hope and we don't create for them hope. Then somebody else will do it for them. Exactly. And thank you for this. So hope is everything. Now, and you've mentioned at a couple points, a political solution. Um, but you've also mentioned no boots on the ground. So what does a, oftentimes in the midst of war, especially civil war, people can't see a way out. So what, is, what, is a what might a political or an interim political solution look like in Syria such that, such that people do lay down their arms and can move towards having a peaceful coexistence with one another? First of all, we need to let all the, uh, all everybody to decide that we, they need to stop the war and they need to come together to the negotiation table. If not negotiation table, at least table to dialogue and talk about their future together. Number two, you, we can't have political solution if we don't think about transitional justice. Transitional justice is to punish everyone who is responsible for killing. Today, we have a problem. People emotionally or non-emotionally, they know that Assad is behind this killing. And there is also ISIS. Don't forget, today ISIS and the uh, Assad regime are working. It's like their team together because they're both killing the Syrian people, because they're both targeting the civil resistance. Many of my friends, they are in the friends, are in the, in the prison with ISIS, and others' friends are in the <coughs> regime's prison. So you have to ask your question, why both of them, they're targeting this civil people, civil actors, who can make a difference on the ground? So what is the solution? To get all those people to get together. We need to think about future, future together without ISIS, without Syrian regime. We have to think about transitional justice to punish everyone who is responsible and who did give the decision or the order to kill. And without this, we can't. I know a lady I met in Jordan. She lost her husband, three sons, and three brother-in-laws. And I can't convince her to come back to the negotiation table if she doesn't see who are responsible for killing all her family members. I'm not the one I decide. The woman who lost their husband and kids and destroyed their house has been destroyed. They're the one they want to come and be part of this dialogue. And you can't have them back and sitting together if they don't know that there is a justice. Justice is everything. Think about South Africa, what happened in Bosnia, what happened. Mm -hmm. Without this justice in place and transition justice, we can't build a nation again. So we need to think about this too, uh, Dr. Simpson, and it's so important. What, here's another question, but maybe not on the policy level. Um, what can we as common Americans do? Or is there anything we can do? Okay. First of all, you have to lead by example. And I always think about this. I learned in your school, I learned about liberty, about dignity. And uh, your Christian nation too, like Jesus taught us to stand by the oppressed against the oppressors. And this is at least you can do is to think about humanitarian, about those people who are dying on the ground and the children. So as an American, first of all, the American people say, we want to stop this killing. Number two, you have to help. Anything you can help women and children 
in the refugee camps to go back home. This is so important. You have to talk with your politicians, put some pressure, tell them we cannot just watch. We don't want to go to war. We don't want to because we don't want you to go to war. You have enough American people paid so much, lots of big price for politics in Iraq and Afghanistan. And many of the Americans died there. And we don't want you to die. We want Americans to be like us and to, to, to stand and say to your government, enough, put some pressure on the Syrian regime. Tell them not to kill the civilian. Put some pressure on your politics. Say we want to give more aids and help the Syrian women and children. I think America has a big role. For you, you are the power, the power of, think about the status of liberty, you have it in New York, it's the symbol of your country. So these people, they ask for freedom. All we ask you, protect them, not let them, because of they ask for their freedom to end up in the refugee camps. And if this is your, if this is will continue, every time people will stand and rise against their dictators, get killed, be gassed by chemical, and, and being and in prison, or starve to death from hunger because of this is what they want, they want freedom, this is your sending message to all the dictators in the world. Kill your own people. Use gas and chemical, no problem. Because guess what? American or others, nobody will take any side. You can do whatever, and this is wrong. Today, we have Syrian people are dying from gas by the regime, killed by the ISIS, starving to death by the Syrian regime, who use the starvation as an arm against their own people. Yes, as an American, stand for your values. Your values is crystal clear. I learned it from your school, and you're the one you're teaching it to your students. The values, American values, and this is what's important. Think and seek social justice. This is the people they're asking you for your help. Not boots on the ground, just be there with them and tell them, yes, we are practicing our American values on the ground. You have our blessing and we're going to help you. Humanitarian, psychological, peace building, anything you can do, you can do it. And I know many organizations, they're doing this like USIP. They have so much work on the ground in doing this. And I think this is the way uh, um, American policy should do, not only humanitarian food and medicine, also empowering the people on the ground and pushing them to have a political solution. And this is your school doing great job here. And I'm very fascinated by the students, the way we have the dialogue today and the way they are so aware of the American value. And I'm so impressed by them. And I think this is a great, great hope for the school to be a seed for this and and I can tell you where I work now in DC at USIP they have this too and there is so many people so place so many places in the US such like your school and other organization they practice their beliefs and I I, th I am so proud to be part of today you have 800 students and they can be the seed for the future and what I see today in, at the lounge I'm so impressed and I know it, it, it touched my heart to see those people, they want to make a difference. And they're so concerned about the human value and the human right. And thanks to this great teachers and great values, and I can see in every corner, it's not only the light from this window coming to the school and the student, they're all wants to make a difference, but their perspective to the and their goal and their vision. Each one of the students I met, they have vision, they have goal, they want to do something. And you know what? I can't see better place than this place, and I'm proud to be part of it. Well, thank you very much, Hen, for being here.